Hey, why don't we do this? Let's get into the Word today. We're going to continue a series that we started last week. We're going through the month of August and potentially into September on some of the realities of who we are in Him. The series is called In Him, a look into your identity in Christ. And we're going to just kind of dig right back into what the Word of God says of who you are in Christ Jesus and what you have because of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at that. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Father, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that it's not a man tonight that we hear from, Lord. We ask that it's not uh, just uh, some crafted, thought-out uh, process from somebody. But we ask tonight that it would be from your Holy Spirit, Lord, your word. We come to hear from you. We acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ as the senior pastor of this church. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us tonight in your word, Lord. That you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, Father, our hearts and our minds to understand your word as you would teach us and you would equip us tonight, Lord. I thank you that we would leave encouraged, Father, for those of us that need encouragement, Lord. I thank you those we would leave equipped and built up in your, in your ministry, Father, in your love and in your plan and your purpose for our lives. And we give you the praise, we give you the honor, Lord, we give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, Amen. Amen. Like I said, this is part number two of In Him. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of John, chapter 1. We're going to talk about the realities of who we are in Jesus Christ. Last week, if you weren't here, you didn't catch part number one. We talked about, um, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And so often we think that our practice and what we do with life and what we do in life is what determines our position with God. But we realize that we actually have that backwards And it's not our practice that determines our position with God, but it's our position that guides our practice with God. We are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And tonight we're going to continue looking at who we are in Him or in Christ Jesus. And I'll start it off by saying and by asking this question, have you ever had a really bad day? All right, let me take it a little step further. Have you ever had a really bad week? Have you ever had a really bad month? Some of you are like, okay, cool, you haven't got there yet, good. Have you ever had, like, a really bad year? Yeah. Now, some of y'all, this is a big one. Have you ever had a really bad decade? <laughs> you just kind of say, man, I want to forget that period of my life. You know, we've all gone through seasons in life where it was just, things weren't looking up. Things weren't going for our favor. Things weren't working to our light. And, you know, oftentimes it's in those dark places of life. It's in those hard times in life that we begin to look at God and we begin to really look deeply into our life and we get this introspective perspective on life as we look deep in and we say, God, where are you in this time? And God, where are you in this season? But did you know that God is incredibly interested in your life? That God is not some distant creation or, or creator. He's not some distant deity up in the skies, up in the heaven that set things in motion and just said, okay, y'all figure it out, you know, just kind of struggle through it, survive, get through it. God is deeply interested in your life. And today as we talk about the realities of who we are in Christ Jesus, I want to talk to you about your life and what God wants for your life and for my life. And as we talk about in Him, I just tell you, I was asking, you know, kind of last minute that I was up here tonight and I just asking God, what do I, what do I talk about? And God just says, well, talk about what I've been talking to you about. So I'm just going to preach to myself and that's all right for you. If you don't get anything out of it, praise Jesus, I did. So it's worth it. I had you go to John in the first chapter. I want to just show you the realities of who we are in Christ. John chapter 1. Uh, John, is, John is, is, is a brilliant gospel. It's my favorite gospel. Whenever somebody starts reading uh, or is new to church and they say, Pastor, look, I, I'm new to this whole Christian thing and I, I pick up my Bible and I'm a little bit intimidated and I'm not quite sure what to do or where to start, I say, without a doubt, start reading John. Just, just pick up John chapter 1, read through it. You can read through it in a day. You know, just read through it, read through it again, read through it again, read through it again because John, I just think, has such a, a vivid image of the mission of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus and, and the purpose that he came in. John had a real creative sense of writing, I believe, here in John, the first chapter. I think he's really kind of taking the Genesis 1 account, and he's creating that into Jesus, and how Jesus fits in the creation of earth. Now, John is bringing Jesus into that, and, and, and he talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and this is Jesus. And John, the first chapter, verse number 4, is talking about Jesus. It says, now we're talking about the series, is called In Him. So, John chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, In Him, Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. In Him, Jesus Christ was life. And the life was the light of men. Right there, as John is talking about the missional statement of who Jesus is and what He came to earth for, you and I need to understand that God is deeply interested in your life. 
It may seem like despite what's going on, uh, hardships, bad seasons, times of trouble or times of, of weariness, times of exhaustion, whatever it might be, times of famine in your own life, it seems like where is God? Does He care? Is He noticing what's going on in my life? You and I, we need to understand that God is deeply interested in your life. Your life matters to God. As a matter of fact, I'll just say it like this. God wants you to live a full life. God wants you to live a full life. Now, I, I was very strategic by the words in which I said there. I didn't want, didn't want to say God wants you to live a happy life. I didn't want you to say God, want to say God wants you to live a good life. God wants you to live a full life. Why? Because God created you for a specific purpose and what you do with your life has everything to do with what God created you to be in. And whether we live in that or not is the acceptance or the identity of who we are in Christ. And we have got to understand that God wants you to live a full life. As a matter of fact, it's the very purpose Jesus Christ came to earth. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus Christ came to die for our sins so that we could be reconnected to God. Yes. Jesus Christ came to earth to give you what you could not have without Him. And that is life. Well, wait a minute. I'm living life today. It's my life. It's my, I'll do what I want to do with it. No. You see, you can live a life, but you cannot live life. Why? Because it said Jesus was the life of men. And so God sent Jesus Christ to walk this earth, to tell us the way to live, to give us the example of His desire and His purpose for us, and then to go to the cross and die, and then to be resurrected from the dead, and then to ascend to heaven, to be seated at the right hand of God. Why? So that you and I could live a full life. Now, maybe you're not clapping in this place because you say, well, right now, I just don't feel like I am living a full life. My life feels a little bit empty today. That's good. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get you to the place of understanding who you are in Christ despite how you feel because that's what's important is an understanding or a look of our identity. I said it's the very purpose and the very reason that Jesus Christ came to this earth. As a matter of fact, Jesus in his own words said it like this in John the 10th chapter, verse number 10. Very familiar scripture. I say it all the time. I just believe in it so much. Jesus is talking about the devil and he says the thief, the devil, he doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. There's nobody knocking on your door with a black ski mask in the middle of the night trying to get a cup of ice. They're coming into your house to take your possessions, to take your joy, to take what is yours for themselves. And Jesus says the thief, the devil is coming like, the devil is coming like a thief to rob your life. Yeah. But look what Jesus says. The purpose of Jesus Christ here on earth. But I, he says, have come. That they, who's they? Who's they? Does anybody know who they is? You. You. He's talking about you, and John's just like, let me write this down. Jesus, what was that? Can I get that point one more time? I have come that they, you, would have what? Life. And have it more abundantly. You see, you and I, we can live life. We wake, wake, we wake up in the morning, and we breathe in, and we breathe out, and we breathe in, and we breathe out, and we breathe in, and we breathe out. We're awake for what, like 16 hours or something like that? And then we go to bed. And then we wake up the next morning, we breathe in and we breathe out, we breathe in and we breathe out, we do other things during the week. That's life. We're living. But God says, I came that you would have life and then have it more abundantly over and above what you think or what you could expect. That's God's desire for you. You see, God wants you to live a full life. And I don't know about you if you've ever just taken a deep look at your own life. I do it a lot. I'm a very introspective person. I do a lot of reflection. Sometimes it's good. And I, had a, I, had a, I had a mentor of mine say that um, uh, reflection, if reflected on too long, becomes depression. So you can't reflect for too long. You just got to kind of reflect, glance at it, take a look at it. Don't go... I, I reflect on my life a lot. I'm always asking these deep questions. I, I inherited a sense of, uh, uh, from my mom, Pastor Deborah. If you ever know mom, you can talk to her and she'll ask you like a couple of questions about yourself. And then instantly she's like... 
a hundred feet deep, like just so deep you can't even like go there anymore. And you're like, where did this come from? Like, I just, I'm, I'm that way sometimes. It, it, so as I reflect upon my life, I look at my life and I think, man, you know, I've, I've got a great life. I've got a beautiful wife. I mean, literally like married my high school sweetheart. I was just talking to a young guy uh, yesterday at a wedding. He was like, I like this girl, but she has a boyfriend. And I'm like, so what? <laughs> Didn't stop me. I got, I got the girl I was going for. I've got two beautiful children. I've got a great home, I've got two cars, I've got dogs, and I've got grass in my backyard, I've got hobbies that I do, I mean, I've got all the different things that, like, you know, we would say is so great, but as I look at my life, and as I take a moment, I reflect on all that I have, and all that I've done, and the places that I've gone, and the people that I've met along the way, and the experiences, and the memories, the highs, and the lows of my own life, and I'm just talking about me, you might be the same way, there's always this sense of, I want more. I, it's like, I'm not done yet. Like, uh, but, but I wonder, why is there this sense of more? I mean, you think about it. Like, the house that I live in. Like, I, I thought that the American dream, like, growing up in economics classes, they used to tell us we had this thing in America called the American dream, right? And that's to own a home with a white picket fence and to have 2.5 children or whatever it is, the average amount, and, and, and to just to live the life. And it's like, okay, wait a minute, I, I own a home and, and I, I don't have a white picket fence because I live in a homeowner's association and they don't let that. But um, I've got two children. Praise God, that's all I want. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for two. Some people are graced for 20. Thank the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. I love my babies. But they're, they're young, so. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. And I look at all these things and I say, why, why do I want more? I mean, am I not living the American dream? So then I start to think back at it and say, well, you know, maybe it's just because the American dream is not a big enough dream. Maybe it's, maybe it's that the little house that I live in is not, not you know, uh, not, not enough. You know, I heard one person when we were talking about home shopping, they were like, you know, I'd settle for 2,000 square feet for a home. And I'm like, did you settle for, for 2,000 square feet? Like, you don't understand what people live in around the world. <laughs> like, they'll, they'll, they'll die for like nine square feet around the world. You know, I mean, literally a roof over their head. And I'd settle for 2,000 square feet and all these different statements. And it's like, well, I don't think that it's not we're dreaming big enough. I think that there's something on the inside of us that God's created on us that is not fulfilled by seeking out a life that we think it is. But the problem is, is that we look at life, and I look at my own life, and I can just use myself as an example, and we look at life and we say, well, but Jesus said I came that you would have life and that you would have life more abundantly. But then I look at what's going on around my life and I say, but God, I want more. But more abundantly doesn't mean more cars. That's right. Come on. That's right. I'm going to step on some toes in him for a minute. More abundantly doesn't mean more square footage. More abundantly doesn't mean more money in your bank account. More abundantly, more abundantly doesn't mean more likes on Facebook. More abundantly doesn't mean more friends. More abundantly doesn't mean more people who show up at your funeral than the other guy. Because of connections and relationships. You see, what's happened is I look and I reflect back on my life and I reflect back on why am I still feeling like I want more in my life? Is that we've taken our culture. Our 21st century perspective that we've grown up into and that we've been taught, that we've been fed through television and stuff like that, and I'm not speaking, you know, like conspiracy theory of that stuff, that's just who we are. We've taken our culture and we've taken the perspective of our culture and we've applied it to a verse that had a different perspective when Jesus came. You see, when Jesus came and he said, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly, Jesus wasn't living in a consumer society. When he said, I came that you would have life, it didn't mean that I came that you would have more Facebook friends. It didn't mean that, I, that you would have more followers on, on Instagram or Twitter. It didn't mean that you would have a, a bigger home than the guy next to you. It didn't mean that you would have more money in your bank account. It didn't mean that you would have more cars. It didn't mean that you would have a, a successful business. It didn't mean that you would have a higher quality of life. But what does that mean then? Because God's interested in my life, and, and, and I'm interested in my life, and would the interests of my life pertain to the quality of my life. And what happens to you and I as we begin to think about who we are in Christ is we look through the lens of our perspective of our culture and we think of it like this. We think that our quality of living is equal to our quality of life. 
Which means if I have more friends, if I have more family, if I have more support, if I have more money, if I have more cars, if I have a bigger home, if I live on the right side of town, if I can keep moving on up like the Jeffersons were talking about, if I can, if I can live a life like that, if I can just up my quality of living on a steady pace, 4% every year, just to follow the inflation rate of money, that my quality of life will follow suit with my quality of living. But the problem, the issue that we run into is that our quality of life is not equal to our quality of living. But we see it through the lens and the perspective of our culture. And this is why we're talking about a look into our identity in Christ. Why? Because we are walking around with a case of mistaken identity. But God, I've had a bad month. God, I've had a bad week. God, I've had a bad day. God, I started tithing and everything went downhill. So my quality of living must equate to my quality of life. God, I started serving you and my family started falling apart. My quality of living must be equal to my quality of life. And we begin to look at God and we say, God, where is the interest in my life that you said you had for me? Because I don't feel it. Has anybody ever been there before? And so we say to Jesus, Jesus, come and fix this mess. Come and resolve these issues. Come and intervene in the quality of my living so that you could increase the quality of my life. And what happens when Jesus comes into our life? He starts to do things like that. I believe that God does bless us. I believe that, that America has, a, has been, become a blessed nation so that we could be a light to the world. I think that we're missing our identity of who we are. Because we've gotten wrapped up in our culture and the things around us. We've gotten wrapped up and more wrapped up in the quality of living than we have the quality of life. Amen, amen. Yep. I, have, I have numerous friends that are all around the world and they talk about how the Americans grind themselves into the ground. You know, nobody else has done they, they always, You know, have you ever, ever been anywhere, ever heard anybody from another country? They always say, you Americans. We talk about you Americans. You Russians. Whatever. Sorry. And so we get this idea that the quality of our living is the quality of our life. But the issue that we look at is when we look at the Bible, specifically the New Testament examples that God has given to us as followers of Jesus Christ, I don't see anywhere these men talking about their beach villas or their vacation destinations. I don't see anywhere them talking about the money that they have and all the different resources that they've been I I don't see them talking about their their clout on Instagram or Facebook. You're like, Pastor Luke, it was 2,000 years ago. They didn't have that. Okay, put ourselves, since we're looking at the Bible in our 21st century mentality, right? I don't see that. You know what I see them talking about? I see them talking about trials. I see them talking about tribulations. I see them talking about hardships. I see them talking about sleepless nights. I see them talking about turmoil. I see them talking about temptations. I see them talking about drama. I see them talking about people abandoning them. I see them talking about all sorts of things other than quality of living. But yet we think that Jesus, I want you to come into my life. And I want you to fix the quality of my living. And Jesus comes and he begins to do something in our hearts and things begin to change. And then what happens? The quality of living begins to obscure the quality of our life. How many people have come to church needing Jesus to do something in their lives and when something in their lives begins to happen, the necessity for God in their life begins to become obscured by the quality of living rather than the quality of life that Jesus Christ brings. And so we miss out on it. I mean, if, if we think really, truly, honestly, if we think that the quality of living is the quality of life, then Paul the Apostle missed God massively. But you see, I believe with all my heart that God called us to a bigger purpose than the quality of living. 
I believe with all of my heart that God called us to a bigger purpose than square footage, than cars, than followers, than money, than clout, than vacations, than destinations, than friends. I believe God has called us to a bigger purpose in life. And our perspective, our identity has gotten wrapped up and skewed. And the whole purpose of this series is for us to have a clarity of who we are in Christ. And if you get nothing out of tonight, understand this, that the quality of your life in Jesus Christ is not based on the quality of your living on earth today. As a matter of fact, John... Since he's the one that's kind of writing these things down, John at the end of his life is he's writing the Gospels or the Epistles of John now. First John, the fifth chapter, John says it like this. John says, he says it like this in the fifth chapter, verse number 12. He says that in the Son, whoever has the Son, Jesus, has life. But he who does not have the Son does not have life. Why? Why? Let me tell you this, because Jesus said in John the 10th chapter, verse number 10, I have come that you would have life and that you would have life more abundantly. Let me just say it like this. If you're taking notes, write it down. Abundant life is not getting all that you want. Abundant life is getting all that God wants for you. That's what Jesus meant. Abundant life is not getting everything you want. Abundant life is getting everything God wants for you. That is abundant life. Because that is the purpose and the reason that Jesus Christ came. In Him was the life of men. And so here we have to recognize and we have to realize that oftentimes the biggest opposition to the life that we live for God is not the devil. It's not your neighbor, and it's certainly not your boss or your wife. The biggest opposition that we face to living the life that God has called for us is us. You are your biggest hurdle, and it's a big hurdle. It's a mountain. Jesus says, you got to speak to that mountain, be thou removed. And cast into the sea. I heard one preacher say, sometimes the biggest mountains that we have to move in our life are the mountains on the inside of us. So as we recognize and we realize that God is deeply interested in our lives. And that God has called us and brought us to a place that He wants us to live a full life. And that abundant life is not getting everything I want, but everything that God wants for me then what I must do is I must realize and come to the understanding in my life that in order for me to achieve the life that God wants for me, in order to fully live life for God, I am going to have to lose myself. I'm going to have to look at myself in the mirror and say, get lost. You're going to have to look at yourself in the mirror and say adios have you ever had a near death experience or known somebody that had a near death experience I remember when our little baby girl Emma was born we were so excited our family hadn't had a girl in 10 years or 9 years 8 years somewhere in that vicinity right Pastor Dan she's 12 right she's 11 so 11 minus 3 7 years we got it praise Jesus the only girl, a bunch of boys, everybody cried and we found out we were having a boy. We were like, hey, we're having a boy. And they're like, oh, we're like, thanks a lot. The joys of being the youngest. Everybody's already done it. So finally we had this girl and everybody's waiting. It's during church services and my mom and a couple other people are there waiting. And Stacy's about ready to give uh, 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 delivery, have delivery with Emma. And I remember my baby girl, Emma, came out. And we were just so excited. We were like, because we waited. We didn't want to know because everybody cried when we found out we were having a boy. So we're like, we're not going through that again. We're just going to go through a surprise. So she came out and they were like, it's a girl. And we were like, oh my gosh. And Emma came out blue. She had the merconium in her lungs and she had all these different complications with breathing. And Emma couldn't breathe. And I remember that moment when Emma came out and she was turning blue. 
the doctor and the nurses looked at me and Stacy was sitting there and or laying there. And the doctor said, Dad, go sit in the corner. And all of a sudden, everybody started rushing into that room. People we didn't know where they came from. People with all this different equipment they didn't know. And they started working on Emma and they started pumping on Emma and they started, they started doing all these different things to get Emma to breathe on her own. She wasn't crying. You know, the, 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 the movie when they slap the baby's butt and the baby starts crying. None of that was happening. And I remember I was just sitting there and we had texted everybody when she came out, it's a girl. So everybody's like, when do we get to see her? We can't wait. What's going on? And then five minutes goes by and then 10 minutes goes by and then 20 minutes goes by and they take Emma out of the room and nobody's saying anything to us and we're like, what's going on? Where's our girl? What happened? And it's amazing that if you've ever been in a near-death experience or you've ever known somebody that's experienced a near-death experience, it's amazing how in that moment, how close to death you can get and how everything changes perspective. And everything that was a big deal a minute ago is not a big deal now. And everything that was massive a few moments ago means nothing ever again. And the more we find that we die to ourselves, the more our perspective begins to change like that near-death experience perspective. And we begin to realize that we actually have a life to live here on earth that God wants us to do something with it. And in order to find life in Him, we're going to have to lose ourselves. Because God did not create you. He did not create me so that I could wake up every morning and I could go to church and I can say, what can God do for me today? That is not what God created you and God did not give you that mindset. Your sin and flesh nature gave you that mindset. God created you and I so that we could live a life of service and dedication to Him so that we could live a life of fullness and fulfillment that says, what can I do for God today? And God wants you to live a full life, a life of meaning and, 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 and reason for existence. I refuse to believe that we are a mathematical anomaly, a a coincidence of chance that we live and we exist and we die when there are billions of stars across the galaxies and somehow we are the ones that made it. I refuse to believe that we are a life of chance. God has given each and every one of us a purpose of life. But when we live a mistaken identity, of thinking that our life is all about quality of living, we are missing our purpose in life. And in order to live life for Christ, we will have to lose ourselves. If there's anybody that knew what this meant, who had a vivid and clear definition of life, it was Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle tells the church on numerous occasions the things that he would face. As a matter of fact, when God called Paul, To the man he called to pray for Paul, he says, I will show Paul the things that he will suffer. Paul talks about being shipwrecked, and Paul talks about being beaten and stoned. Paul talks about being rejected by men. Paul talks about the hardships of life. And and if there was anybody that understood that the quality of living was not equal to the quality of life, it was Paul the Apostle. So that in Galatians in the second chapter, when Paul the Apostle can write to the church about quality of life, Paul can begin to say things to them like, the life that I live, I no longer live for me. Why? Because I and myself, my flesh, I have been crucified in Christ. I have died in order to find my life. I've got to lose myself. And Paul says, I am losing myself. Why? The life that I live, he says, is no longer me living, but is now Christ in me through faith that is living. I am living living life. So now we have to come to this realization and this understanding that despite a bad day, despite a bad week, despite a bad month, despite a bad year, despite a bad decade, despite the health of your children, despite the financial situation that you're in, despite your boss or your wife or your husband, despite what's going on in the world around you, we have got to come to the understanding of identity to realize and recognize that the quality of life that we live is not based on the quality of living of our life. I was talking to a young man. I, I, I'd heard his story. And, and I just, I, I got to see him a couple of uh, this last week and, This young man is from a a ministry dynasty. If I was to say his name and his family, 
He is from a just a power-packed dynasty of ministers, particular, per, particularly pertaining to children's ministry. And he had announced a couple of years ago that he was going to move from the Midwest to, to Los Angeles and start a church. And I'd seen him across, and I, we'd, we'd been in the same circles in different places, and finally he was at this place, and I saw him standing against a wall the other day, and I, I went up to him because I just wanted to know. And I asked him, I said, you know, I understand the God aspect of it. But aside from God, what was it that made you decide to leave the legacy of your family behind and go to a place where nobody you knew was supporting you? And he said, for seven years, I was doing something and I was comfortable, he said. I had a great life. I was really happy, with, comfortable with what I was doing, but he said, I had no peace. And I said to God in my prayers one day, I said, God, I would rather live a life of peace in Jesus Christ than comfort here on earth. And he said, God called me to L.A. by myself. And I thought, how many of us, when we say, God, use me, God, bless me, God, move on me, God, speak to me, God, utilize this life, I give it to you, and God says, I want to pull you out of your comfort zone. How many of us say, well... I'd rather have quality of living. I mean, you think about it, and I don't blame anybody, and I don't say that judgmentally. It's logic and it's common sense. I mean, if I was up here to preach to you and say, follow Jesus Christ and your life's going to fall apart, you're going to have persecutions, they're going to drag you out, they're going to lock you up in jail, they're going to take your kids away from you, they're going to try to kill you, they're going to stone you. I would, I would totally, in my heart, in my head, have a realistic expectation that nobody would stay around. But the funny thing is, is that's exactly what Jesus said is that there's a cost to following me. There's a cost to following me, and your quality of life or your quality of living might come at the expense of your quality of life, but when your quality of life is not based on your quality of living, your quality of life is based on Jesus. It doesn't matter what or where you do. Paul says, I have learned to, to live with much with little. I have learned to go without sleep. I have learned I, I, can, do, I can do with nothing. I can do with more. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's going to take an understanding of our identity of who we are in Jesus Christ to recognize that God is interested in our life and He wants to do something with your life, but it's going to take you losing you and me losing me in order for us to live according to what God wants for us. Abundant life. In the fifth chapter of Galatians in the New Living Translation, I'll just put it up on the overhead, it says, those who belong to Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading. You want life because you have it in Jesus. If you want life in Jesus, you're going to have to lose you. The biggest opposition to your life. Because you see, it's a matter of created identity. God puts something on the inside of you to always want more. Why? So that you would look to Him. There's a hard reality. Can we just be real for a minute? There's a hard reality that we all have to go through with life not understanding. And that is that everything that has happened, God has allowed. Everything that has happened to you, God has allowed. Everything that has happened on earth, God has allowed. Why? Because he could have stopped it at any given time, but he allowed it to happen. Why? To point you, not to quality of living, to point you and I to God in life. That we would look to the left and that we would look to the right and we would realize that this world has nothing for me to offer when it comes to life. But my answer and my position and my purpose and my life is based upon Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what my quality of living is because my quality of life is in Him. And you were created by God to serve Him. You were created, I mean, think about this for a moment, all the way back to the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
And God said, and He spoke. And on the next day, He spoke. And on the next day, He spoke. And God spoke to the seas. And God spoke to the land. And God spoke to the birds of the air. And God spoke to the fish in the sea. And God spoke to the plants on the earth. But the one thing God did not speak to was humanity. Because in Genesis, the second chapter, it talks about the creation of humanity. And it says that God breathed the breath of life into humanity. Church, He spoke life into everything else. He breathed life into you. He spoke life into everything else, but God breathed life into you. You see, God's purpose from the very beginning has been deeply interested in our lives. But we've been so backwards and so mismatched in our perspective that we're walking around mistaken in who we are. And we're mad at God and we're frustrated and we say, God, where are you? God, why are you? God, why is this happening? And God says, stop looking at the quality of your living and start looking at the quality of your life. And as Paul the Apostle comes to the end of his life and he speaks to his young protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy, Paul says these words. He says, I'm being poured out as an offering. I'm being emptied in my life. He says, I, I'm finished. The, the, the end of my life is near. Paul is writing this in, in a prison, understanding that in, just, in, in a short amount of time, he is going to die for Jesus. The time of my life is drawing to an end. He says, I fought the fight. I finished the race. But look what Paul's perspective on the quality of life is. He says these words, I finished the race, and now, and, and now... And now, the prize awaits me. And now, the quality of living awaits me. Paul understood what it was like to not have quality of living in his life. But he says, and now, quality of living awaits me, the prize, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And I love this. And the prize is not just for me. It's for everyone who awaits the coming of Jesus Christ. For everyone who recognizes that in Jesus there is life. For everyone who realizes that the quality of their living is not based upon the quality or their quality of life is not based upon the quality of living. Their quality of life is based upon Jesus. To everyone who realizes that and who lives and believes in Jesus Christ, he says, the prize is coming your way. God is deeply interested in your life. And maybe right now, maybe right now, you have a really sour, a really bad quality of living. A hard season. But don't let the quality of living obscure the quality of life that God has for you. Because your life is not based on what you have or what you've accomplished. Your life is based on Jesus. Abundant life is not getting all that you want. Abundant life is getting all that God wants for you. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. Lord, there are many of in this place that, tonight that we are living empty. Father, we're living broken. Father, we're living from one day to the next just trying to keep our heads above water. I'm, a, I'm in that place myself. And God, we just ask tonight that we would understand who we are in Christ. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in the seasons of our lives, the triumphs and the troubles. Lord, that you would reveal to us your plan and your purpose for our life. And Lord, that you would begin to speak to each and every one of us and that we would recognize that it doesn't matter about the quality of our living, but that the quality of our life is based upon Jesus because in him was life and the light was the life of men. So Father, we look to Jesus as our life. We look to Jesus as the one who came to bring us life and life more abundantly. And Lord, I thank you that your Holy Spirit would come and comfort those who need to be comforted right now. Those of us who are in this place that are empty, that are searching for more, that are wondering, what's the next step, God? What are you going to do with me and for me and to me? Lord, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to minister to us, to comfort us in our time of need, that we might have peace rather than comfort, comfortable life. So Lord, we thank you that we come and we dedicate and we look to our lives and we look to you and we say, Lord, we recognize that in Jesus is life. 
we have life in Him and in Him alone. Before we leave tonight, I want to take just a quick moment to those of, talk to those of you who are in this place. That maybe you're living empty. Maybe there's just something not connecting. Maybe no matter how hard you try, it seems like nothing is working out in your favor. Maybe you've been living your entire life thinking that your quality of living is equal to the quality of life. But today I want to talk to you and give you the invitation of Jesus Christ in your life because God did not create you. He did not design you. He did not purpose for you to live disconnected, to live empty, to live void, to live groping about in the darkness like Paul the Apostle talks in the book of Acts. God purposed for you to live a life in the light of Jesus Christ, in life. Sometimes we think that life comes because we attend church. Sometimes we think that life comes because we, we, we wear a cross around our neck. Sometimes we think that life comes be, because we've given ourselves the title and titles mean life, but did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can attend church on a regular basis? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've got a cross around your neck. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you call yourself a Christian or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Methodist or whatever else you want to call yourself. Does that mean that you're going to find life? You might live a life, but you're not living God's life. So often we think that a life of fulfillment, we've all seen those movies where that person stood up around everybody else and they all loved him. And at the end of their life, that movie talks about how many people came to their funeral and that's what life is all about influence and as long as I'm a good person and I do good things and I influence people for positivity that that's a, a life but you got to understand that God did not call you to count the people at your funeral God called you for life in Jesus Christ and on not only that the Bible is very clear it tells us that when we all die that we're destined for an eternal destination. We're headed for an eternal destination. There's only two options. It's heaven or hell. Presence of God in heaven or eternal separation from God in hell. See, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But the Bible tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to receive that gift of Jesus Christ today in your life to receive and to accept the life of Jesus Christ in your life, to start living not what you want, but to start living what God wants and to see what life is really all about today. Jesus says these words in John the third chapter. He's talking to a religious man. He says, in order to inherit, inherit is a person of position, in order to be a part of the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. Born again is not what you think it is. And Hollywood society's made it out to be born again from the beginning of God's word to the end of God's word always means the same thing in God's heart and God's eyes. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to his church. He says, listen, I know your deeds. I know your works. He says, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you. I'll reject you. I'll expel you from the kingdom of God. He says, you think that you're rich and glorious he says, but you don't realize how naked and how destitute you are. He says, oh, I wish that you would come to me. And then following that statement, Jesus says these words to his church. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I believe he's knocking on the door of your heart right now. He's exposing. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will convict the, sin, the world of sin and righteousness. I believe right now God is exposing that emptiness that disconnection on the inside. I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to take a moment. We're not embarrassed. We're not ashamed. But we want you to take a moment of privacy for you and the person around you. To close your eyes and bow your heads and think solely upon your position and your place with God. Shut everything out. Where are you with God? Right now, if you're honest and if you're open with yourself, do you feel the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart saying, I want you. I chose you. I destined you for life. But you need to open the door first. If that's you in this place in just a moment. With everybody in their moment of privacy, in their moment of reflection. If that's you in just a moment together, I want you to do something. I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want that life that you were talking about today. And if I've got to lose myself to find it, I want to lose myself to find it. In just a moment, what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. A prayer asking and inviting Jesus to open our hearts and to come and to live and to dwell and to be that Lord and that Savior of our lives. 
If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if that's you in just a moment. If you're not sure, if that's you in just a moment. If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, doing some of your own thing instead of God's thing, occasional church attendance, token prayer. If that's you in this place today, empty on the inside. The Bible says that God has given us his seal of approval on the inside of us, his Holy Spirit, so that we would know without a shadow of a doubt his presence in us. You've got life with Jesus Christ. But if that's you in this place today, you say, I want to make that decision to give my life to Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, if that's you, you just pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge you. Put it right back down. Right after that, we'll pray a prayer together. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator, a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And it's your choice today. Will you tonight respond to the calling of the Holy Spirit in your heart? I believe all across this auditorium, he's knocking on your heart. And the decision is yours. The gift of God is eternal salvation. Jesus says that he whoever believes in me will not die but have everlasting life. See, God has given you a purpose and a plan, but it comes by following Jesus Christ. All across this auditorium, you've had doctors and dentist appointments. Tonight, it's a, den- a, de- a divine appointment between you and God. All across this place, if that's you in this place, I'm going to count to three and I'll do I'll smack my hand on my Bible. If that's you, you pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and you put it right back down and we'll pray a prayer of salvation together right after that. Ready? I'm going to count to three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. I see you, 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 I see you. Anybody else in this place today? That's you. Pop your hand up so I can see you. Six or seven wise people. I see you back there in the back. Anybody else in this place? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I see you back there. I see you guys back there. I see all three of you. Good. That's you. The Spirit of God's knocking on your heart. It's your moment. This is your time to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ in your life. Anybody else in this place today? All over this place, hands were going up. About 10, 11 wise people. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Anybody else today? See the usher's point over there. I see you, my man. Anybody else today? See the usher's point over there. I see you, my man. Let's give the Lord a great big praise in this house today. For those of you that are making the decision, you're making the very best decision you could possibly make. But you need to know this, that every decision without action is no decision at all and nothing will ever change just because you raised your hand and it's your service. So we want to follow up. We want to equip you and empower you to live the life that God has called you to live. And so here's what we're going to do in just a moment. I said we're all going to pray together. We're going to do that together. We're all going to stand. And if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, if it's important enough for you to make that decision to answer the call of Jesus Christ and it's important enough for you to follow through, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, if you can brought a family member, or somebody raise their hand next to you and say, come on, I'll go with you. Or look to somebody and say, will you go with me? I want you to get out of your seat and get out of your chair. I want you to come in. I want you to meet me right here at this altar so, because we're going to change destinies together with Jesus Christ. We're all going to stand and Elijah's going to sing a song. And as we do, if that's you in this place today, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. Let's change destinies and receive life together right here, right now. If that's you, you come wherever you're at. Front row, back row, side to side. You come wherever you're at. This is your moment. Come on. Come and meet me here today. Jesus, if you're not my everything If that's you, you come. Let's give them a praise as they come. Let's encourage them. Well, praise God, you guys came. And I got to tell you something. You're making the very best decision you have ever made in your entire life. And you know what? Maybe you've made some pretty bad choices. Maybe nobody's ever told you, but let me be the first person to tell you today. Good job. Good job. You're doing a good job. Choosing life. Here's what I want to do. We said we're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy waving at you right over here? His name name is Pastor Joel. 
He's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. I want to take you just into a nice, intimate place where you can have a moment with God without the distractions of everybody around watching you. So he's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information, some literature that we have from, from the church to help point you in the right direction of your life. As you say, I'm going to follow Jesus. We're going to help set you off on the right foot. And the third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back and get connected with somebody here at the church that will come alongside of you for a couple of weeks to teach you some things about the Word of God, to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. But you go forward in everything we have. And we even got comic books for the kids so you guys can read something and kind of have, and, and look at the pictures because I like pictures too. So if you guys should just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my friend, Pastor Joel. Let's give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord.